thank you for coming, and a special thank you to those who are joining us online. Uh, my name is Christy Feig, and I will be your guide today on behalf of the Migration and Health Program here at WHO's Regional Office for Euro. This is the fifth in a series of webinars exploring different health issues around migrants and refugees, and today we're really going to do a deep dive uh, into the issue of maternal newborn health and the lower health outcomes in those communities with refugees and migrants as opposed to their counterparts who are non-migrants. So it'll be a very interesting discussion for today. I'm going to do a little bit of administration first to tell you how you can participate uh, in today's webinar and then we will get going. We want you to ask questions. Did my mic just die? Yeah. <laughs> Testing one, two, three. Very good. Trying to put me in a box over here, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so we want you to ask questions during it. It's one of the beauties. Uh, these webinars have top-notch panels, uh, and the speakers today are no exception uh, at all. They are, they are fantastic and top in their field and what they do. Uh, so we want you to have a time to ask them questions. And the way that we're going to do that is through a platform called Slido. Uh, if you are viewing this online, it's quite simple. You are viewing us in a box on your screen right now. If you scroll down just a little bit more, you will see a box where you can type a question and hit send. If you are sitting in the room, it is even easier than that. You raise your hand. If you are watching this on your mobile phone, you will need to download the Slido app for that. You will likely need an event code, and the event code for this is hashtag KHHM for Knowledge Hub on the Health of Migrants, KHHM. They kindly put the hashtag there for you, uh, so the rest of it is up to you. And then you will find the place where you can ask questions um, as well. When it comes time to questions, I will try to take about three questions at a time. Uh, because we can get to more that way, and then the panelists will answer the ones relevant to their areas of work uh, as we go through that way. Now, there's more things you can do to stay active in today's session. Uh, you can actually have a little bit of control over what questions we get to. Uh, the questions that are coming in online will be on that screen there, and you will notice on your platform, you can actually give it a little thumbs up. Uh, if you want to push it up the list of questions a little bit more. So if there's a great question that you see there and you want to hear the answer to that and you're not quite sure we're going to get to it today, give it a thumbs up. Push it up the list just a little bit longer. You can also tweet on the platform and on your mobile phone as normal. Uh, you can also tweet, and I really want to encourage you to do that um, because the beauty of these webinars is we're tackling some really tough issues that are very current today. And we are sharing best practices, we are sharing experiences, we are talking about what's in place and how we can all work forward together uh, to try to address some of these issues. It all depends on your networks, and that's the beauty of Twitter, isn't it? Uh, so if you can actually put out on Twitter right now that you're watching this webinar. There's some great discussions going on on health issues around maternal newborn health in refugees and migrants, because if we can get all of these discussions going even broader, then we can all get working in the same direction and we really can make a difference in this area. Any questions about how you ask questions? Joseph is far more fluent than me on this, so. He will probably be the one to ask good questions to. Let me make sure I've done all of my to-do list here. Stand by for a moment. Ah, yes. Uh, there will also, at some point, be a survey that comes up. You'll see it on the same platform. There is a tab for questions, and there is a tab for the survey. We just want to make sure that you give that some thought and give us your answers to that uh, before you leave the platform completely today. It's not urgent right now, but it is important today uh, because that helps us frame these webinars in the way that helps you the most. All right, we have a stellar panel today. I will introduce them as we come to them uh, for their particular sessions, but we're really going to do a deep dive on maternal newborn health issues in refugees and migrants communities. We're going to start with the magnitude of the problem, really get our heads around what we're talking about here. Then we're going to explore some of the factors contributing to these problems, both on the policy side and on the clinician side. Really get a, a multi-directional understanding of what's going on here. And then we're going to talk about some solutions on how we can move forward to address this, especially 
especially given what tools and frameworks are already in place. All right, so big time. We're going to spend about 30 minutes talking uh, here now. Then we will open it up for questions. So be thinking of your questions as we go along the way, and we'll go ahead and get started. And I will introduce each of your speakers as we get to those particular points. So for the magnitude, we're going to start with Dr. Inez Kenyart. She's with the International Center of Reproductive Health at Ghent University and the Center for the Social Study of Migration and Refugees. In that capacity, she is the team leader of the Gender and Violence Team, and they do research on sexual, gender-based, and domestic violence, harmful cultural practices, and gender in adolescent and migrant sexual health. She is also a renowned expert on sexual violence and migrant health, and in that capacity, she serves as an international consultant uh, to different organizations and agencies. I'm going to turn to you at this point and let you just kind of take it away for about seven minutes, tell us what some of the issues are, uh, just to give us a foundation to work with, if you would, for the next hour and a half. Okay, thank you, Christy. Mm -hmm. I think you all know that the number of female migrants in the WHO European region is rapidly increasing, so that poses quite some health risks, and research is anonymous. The um, health and health needs of migrants might differ greatly of that of the general European population, and unfortunately for maternal health, migrant maternal health, it has been evidenced that for a lot of uh, health outcomes, the uh, migrant uh, maternal health is poor compared to uh, or compared with non-migrants. Now we have to emphasize that this is not the case for all migrants, not in all European countries or WHO European region countries alike, and not for all health out outcomes needed. Let me give a first example of what might be better often is birth weight. Um, you know that birth weight is a health indicator of an infant and uh, not only for an infant immediate health but also for its later um, uh, health as it has been uh, linked with uh, the development of chronic diseases and other uh, uh, adverse health outcomes later in life. Now birth weight is influenced by a number of factors for example, um, uh, malnutrition of uh, the pregnant uh, mother, but also uh, with uh, stress factors or traumatic uh, events and also a uh, healthy lifestyle. And a lot of research has demonstrated that migrants often tend to have a better healthy lifestyle. They tend to drink less alcohol, they t tend to smoke less, which can influence the birth weight, that it's better than non-migrants. Now we also have the healthy migrant effect that has been proven that also for uh, on maternal uh, side, it has proven to be better. So women, pregnant women that arrive in a country, um, they often have a better birth weight and that is the healthy migrant effect, but that tends to um, deteriorate very quickly. The longer they stay in the country and they have other babies, the birth weight goes down and it becomes about the same level as the non-migrant um, women, but it even deteriorates further and in a second and even third generation it has been shown to be uh, worse. Now, other researchers, for example, in Sweden, have shown that uh, there are other factors uh, to it. It's not just where you come from, that the, uh, the human development index of a country has a big of importance as well, which uh, can, uh, make, uh, can assure that some women have lower birth weights, or the babies are, have lower birth weights, some 120 grams uh, differences. And then other uh, studies have also shown that ethnicity plays a role. For example, uh, some studies in Portugal and the Netherlands and in Italy have shown that the migrant women from sub-Saharan Africa had also four times more risk of, a lo of giving birth to a baby with a lower birth risk. This is a bit the same for preeclampsia and for preterm birth. So in some countries it's better for migrants compared uh, with uh, non-migrants and in others it's a bit less. Now, unfortunately, for a lot of other uh, health outcomes, maternal health outcomes, we know that it's worse for um, migrants compared with non-migrants. For example, they have more unplanned and unwanted pregnancies, and we know that if a baby is unwanted, it often has uh, less birth weight as well, about 156 grams less. They have more induced abortions. For example, in the recent federation, there were researchers that have been demonstrating that about half of the migrants, their, uh, their pregnancies ended in um, induced abortions. They have more unplanned C-sections. They have more instrumental deliveries and complications. For example, in the Netherlands, in UK, in Portugal, there were, uh, was research done which showed that the women had more uh, excessive bleeding during um, 
the, the delivery, uh, that there had also more uh, birth trauma and fetal uh, distress. They have more infant uh, mortality. For example, another study in uh, the Russian Federation showed that one out of 10 migrants at uh, the pregnancies ended in stillbirth or miscarriages. And what is very consistent in the findings is that there's a much higher rate of maternal uh, mortality. There was a review done in uh, several Western European countries in which it was shown that migrant women have a double risk of dying during uh, pregnancy uh, compared uh, to uh, non uh, migrants. In Kyrgyzstan, one out of four uh, maternal deaths was re that were registered were of migrants. And in Sweden, there was a study that uh, for African women, so ethnicity come back, comes back up again, that um, uh, African women had six times more uh, chances of dying during pregnancy, 13 times more chances of dying during <laughs> the delivery, and 18 times more chances of dying shortly after mm. um, the uh, haven't given uh, birth. They also have more risk of STIs and of a later diagnosis of HIV in uh, pregnancy. Now, then, if you look at maternal mental health, uh, we also see there that it's much worse compared to non-migrant women. For example, one out of three women uh, seem to have perinatal depression, and one out of five migrant women have general uh, depression. We also see a lot of PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome, that is uh, often linked to traumatic events that they have been living through uh, before they migrated, mm -hmm. but also to sexual and gender-based violence prior to migration, during migration, but even also when arriving in the region. We know that migrants, and especially refugees, asylum seekers, and undocumented migrants are twice or three times more at risk of sexual victimization once they arrived here eh, compared to uh, non-migrants. So this gives also a lot of risks, um, but also a lot of mental uh, uh, ill health uh, consequences. And um, what we see a lot is that once they arrive here, we assume now you can be at peace, eh? you can, uh, or you can be at ease as well, and uh, you can get better. But they often have a lot of stress here. Eh? They have poor social networks um, and a lot of, of uh, um, things that are on their heads, so they have quite some problems to get the, keep the head above the water. Um, and uh, we see in quite some studies now, more and more, that this might put a lot of tension in their relationships with their partners, and that then, compared to their, their country of origin, there is now violence in pregnancy or uh, intimate partner violence coming up also during pregnancy, which poses a lot of health risk, again, for mother and baby. Um, and also, again, not only on the physical level, even this could have fatal uh, outcome, but also a lot of mental ill health uh, uh, problems and stress we know during pregnancy is not a good uh, factor uh, for mother and baby. PTSD as well is also uh, linked to changes in cortisol levels and other stress hormones, which of again, can have a lot of effect on mother and baby. But also, once the baby is born, we see that a lot of women who have uh, PTSD develop um, insecure attachment styles with that baby, which leads in that baby to new risks of uh, victimization, but also for mental ill health problems, again, for that baby uh, to, to develop. So we know it becomes much more difficult for that child to trust, to bond with people in the new society where he or she lives and to thrive. So that's a bit in gross, the most important uh, elements. I Thank think. you, Inez. Uh, excellent picture uh, to help us understand what we're looking at here. If I can ask you a couple of questions. You scratched the surface on it just a little bit there, and I would like to ask you to elaborate just a little bit more on some mm. of the contributing factors. And to what degree are these factors uh, in um, a maternal health situation because of the migrant capacity? Uh, mm -hmm. Is it something that you can specifically link to that, or are there other situations at play there? Well, um, I think several studies have shown that there are, of course, some biological factors or that have to do with the, the countries of origin. So I already said that the human development index, if they come from countries with a low human development index, it already uh, puts some, some uh, health uh, well, it puts them more at risk of uh, health problems. 
uh, we also see that a lot of migrant women, that depends a bit of the countries also where they come from, that they might have um, higher levels of hypertension, of anemia, um, uh, or a higher body mass uh, index, which could also uh, influence. Um, but we, what we often see that once they are here, when, once they are in the, in the European um, region, that they have very low access to family planning and that they use contraception very little, uh, that they have a very low uptake of gyno uh, gynecological health care in general, and that once they are pregnant, we see also that they, ha they come very late. Um, well, it's not for all migrants. Um, there are, it really depends on the level of education, how the proficiency in, in, in language, the age they have um, for well, a lot of reasons. But generally, especially in undocumented migrants, we see that they come not only later uh, in pregnancy, they come uh, less frequent uh, or they come not at all. There were several studies that showed, uh, like for example, a study in the Netherlands where only 19% of the, where, yeah, uh, no, 90% of the migrants did not even uh, have uh, uh, antenatal uh, visit. Nine zero? Ninety uh, percent? Uh, one nine. One nine, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> thank you. But in um, the... Um, Moscow, for example, it was, uh, no, in Kyrgyzstan, it was 97%. Wow. Yeah, that's very high. And in Moscow, there was an, another study that mentioned that there was uh, only 56% of, uh, well, did not go. Eh? So not that's go. really a, a high number. And uh, another study in the Netherlands also showed that, like for undocumented women, compared to non undocumented migrant mm -hmm. women and non migrant women, um, that they, uh, went to see a gynecologist or a midwife uh, five weeks later for the first time and that they went also three times less. Oh. So this is really something that is uh, a problem that I, I think we should uh, uh, tackle. Um, and then we also see some uh, things that are, can be more related to cultural aspects. They are unfam more unfamiliar with the, the health system. They have some troubles to navigate the health system. But we uh, also have in some uh, uh, countries of origin where um, female genital uh, mutilation um, is practiced, that mm -hmm. these women also have much more uh, problems due, well, to get pregnant during preg pregnancy. They have more uh, infections. And when they have to deliver the baby, um, they receive that it's uh, often more difficult for the cervical dilation uh, or the second labor, um, the second stage of labor is taking much longer. They need more C-sections and they have uh, more stillbirths as well. And uh, in like in Tajikistan or Azerbaijan, we know that in the last years there was a lot of bride kidnapping mm -hmm. and also um, forced marriages. So the girls uh, are often uh, then uh, also having much more, more problems uh, uh, there. One last question for you. What about the health services and the policies in the host countries? To, to what degree do they contribute to poorer maternal health as well? Well, I think they, they contribute a lot. Um, first of all, um, I think in the organization of the health services, um, we see that uh, a lot of doctors... Uh, mostly for the midwives it's better but for the doctors they're not that well trained to uh, give uh, care uh, well uh, not in, in all uh, European countries to to deliver care and to provide care to uh, migrants um, also about uh, sexual and gender-based violence they do not know how to treat with uh, to deal with that mm. they have never seen uh, women who has be uh, who has uh, been uh, suffering from uh, female genital uh, mutilation and there are a lot of communication problems that could be uh, solved if they were uh, more trained at that or if that uh, systems were developed for that there are a lot of practical tools that could be uh, used um, so on the communication level but also on the 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 more cultural side how a woman is going through pregnancy, mm -hmm. what it means. Like I did uh, some 10 years back, I did a, a study with a lot of uh, migrants in Belgium and uh, the Netherlands, and uh, mostly the ones from the cis region, but also from the Middle East, they say, they said, uh, you are not a woman if you have not become a mother. So for mm -hmm. them, it's really, really important. Everything that has to do with sexual and reproductive health, and it's mostly the maternal health aspect, if things go wrong there, or how they uh, live through the, the pregnancy and the delivery, uh, if you do not understand what that means, it can uh, cause a lot of tensions uh, between uh, the patient and uh, the caregiver. So I think the midwife-patient uh, relation can be very important there to bridge the cultures. And then for entitlement, the policies, we know that throughout the whole uh, WHO European region, the entitlements are very, very different. Mm. Um, it's often linked to emergency um, 
care. But then what is emergency? In some countries they say, well, delivery, the delivery, we see that as an emergency, but everything that has to do uh, during pregnancy and after pregnancy is not seen as an emergency. Now in other countries they say, well, if you're pregnant, you know that eventually we will have to give birth. So you can arrange all your insurances or you can save up the money you need uh, to, uh, to pay for the pregnancy. So it's very, very different how the entitlements are. And it's often also linked to the legal status that they have. What we often see is that it, for refugees and asylum seekers, like for example also in Armenia, uh, in Romania as well, you have the same uh, um, access. But if you're undocumented, it becomes uh, much more difficult and there's a lot of more restrictions there. I noticed you have a booklet in front of you that you worked on that yep. might give people some more information on this. Could you just tell them a little bit about it and show it to them? Yeah. So that's the Health uh, Evidence uh, Network report. I think we published this in 2015 or two early 2016. Uh, is the uh, 45th report, and it's called What's the Evidence on the Reduction of Inequalities in Accessibility and Quality of Maternal Health Care Delivery for Migrants? And you can download it from the WHO um, website. It's also in PubMed for the researchers here in the room or in the audience. <laughs> thank you so much, Inez. A couple of uh, shocking statistics there. Um, good numbers, thank you for those. And uh, one of those that really stuck with me was the idea that migrant women have double the risk of dying during pregnancy uh, than non-migrant women and the issue that they have very low access to family planning yes. um, and uh, gynecological care uh, as well. So thank you for that. I want to take just a minute and switch gears just slightly, maybe it's more of a sidestep, uh, to focus on the clinical aspects of this particular topic. Um, and I'm going to turn to Brigitte Essen, Dr. Brigitte Essen, for that uh, particular conversation. She is a professor at the Department of Women's Health and Children's Health at Uppsala University in Sweden. She is also a senior consultant in the Obstetric and Gynecolo Gynecological University Hospital. Tongue twister there, sorry about that. Uh, her research focuses on how maternal and perinatal morbidity is linked to sociocultural factors, and this includes analysis of sexual and reproductive ill health in both low and high income settings to develop tools for comprehensive reproductive health services. Brigitte, I'm gonna to turn to you because I could fill your seven minutes just talking about your credentials, but I'll try not to do that, thank you. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much for this introduction. I'm sorry, I'm native Swedish, so my English is broken. But nevertheless, I would try to follow your figures and go a little bit beyond the numbers. We heard about the numbers, and uh, in research, it's very important to not only what are we going to do with the numbers. And I think it's very interesting that for since the mid 90s, uh, we have known that there are uh, differences in health outcome, in reproductive health outcome between foreign born uh, women and native born <coughs> women born in the same country. I think that is interesting that we're still talking about this discrepancy. And uh, let me give a case where I think that we have uh, failed so far, where, where we have not realized uh, the problem. And that when I say we, now I'm in the role of being a healthcare provider. I could be a midwife, a nurse, or a, a, a doctor. Okay, so let me talk about a case recently, a young uh, adolescent who died in Sweden. She was 16 years old, she became a single girl from uh, uncompanied girl from uh, Somalia and as many Somalia she found a lot of of her clan in Sweden she got the network there great she became pregnant <laughs> without know who was the father she came to antenatal care and the midwives they identified the socioeconomic backgrounds the risk factors and so on and after a while she started to say that uh, she was um, uh, she started to vomiting and lose weight <coughs> and headache and, and the midwife said, yeah, it's, it's really this, she has a social uh, and, and a big social pressure, and this is symptoms of that. And of course, all pregnant women there are, are uh, having this vomiting. Anyway, nevertheless, they sent her to the hospital, and they g gave her some um, intravenous uh, fluids to compensate her, her uh, vomiting and so on. But she still had uh, uh, some fever and headache and so on. But nobody really digged into and, and understand why did she have a fever she was uh, and, and penetrate more her, her uh, history. 
Some days uh, after being discharged from the hospital, uh, she died, and, and we found out she had tuberculosis, and she had tuberculosis in her whole body and even in the brain. And this is an example just to, to show that uh, the higher burden of disease that we, we are, have forgotten in, in Europe and that we don't really are good enough to, to recognize when we should do. We can also see that the higher burden of disease when it comes to uh, cardiac, um, cardiac, uh, cardiac diseases uh, that we do not see among European women anymore because we have a preventive health care in Europe that detect uh, cardiac diseases among children. But when we have uh, women from low-income countries coming to Europe, we miss that they haven't been part of preventive, uh, preventive health care during the, their infant and they become very ill as pregnant. Okay, this is the one example of quality of care, where the quality of care is behind many deaths. We can't cure tuberculosis, seems many decades ago, right? Yeah. The second is, uh, I have a woman from Syria, she is 39 years old, she has five kids already, and she had a late miscarriage. And uh, she's been living for uh, some years in Sweden, but she still do not speak Swedish at all. Uh, she had this late miscarriage, she was treated for it, went to the hospital. Some days after, uh, she came and had a problem with her breathing. She did went back to the gynecological ward, she went to the health center. She met a new doctor there. And that doctor, they didn't really uh, communicate with interpreter, but in one another way he thought, hmm, she has some uh, problem with the breathing and pain. Let's send her to the hospital. It might be, let's, I just want to, for sure, to, 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 to see that it's not a, a, a thromboembolic disease, you know, when you have a, a <coughs> embolia in the, in the lungs. That was his, his um, first uh, diagnosis. Sent her to the hospital, and at the hospital, uh, the new physician, he didn't even take any further medical history, he couldn't connect and see her uh, records, what has been happening, that he, she has been uh, pregnant. And the woman, she didn't communicate because they didn't have any common language. And uh, she was sent home without any examination, without any deeper and, uh, uh, history, uh, medical history. And she was sent home with some uh, painkillers. And she died some days after mm. in, in a fulminant uh, uh, embolic disease in the lungs. 39 years old. Wow. Okay, so it's very interesting. I published a, 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 a paper in the late 90s where we for the first time could see that perinatal mortality was strictly linked to uh, misuse or non-use of interpreter. There was a communication problem that every uh, one baby in Sweden died every year due to lack of interpreter. That is 20 years ago. And still we don't have routines for that. Nevertheless, in the European Council, we have an excellent system how to communicate between people who do not have the same language. Okay, so we know we have the tools, but we have not implemented. Okay, the third example I will have is a lovely story. I have taken two bad stories now. Mm -hmm. This is about culture change. And I just want to recognize the whole, uh, on group level, to recognize how culture, a deeply rooted tradition has been changed among the Somali uh, families in Europe. How they rather quickly have changed their attitudes and the practice of female genital cutting. We don't see that they practice this anymore in Europe. And it's a fantastic story. But uh, it's an example of when culture actually really matter, but when culture is dynamic. And we, we could see uh, in a recent published study that 95% of the uh, Somalis in Sweden, they don't, they don't go for uh, circumcise their daughter anymore. And the, mid uh, and the nurse, uh, the second example is when the nurse in Sweden, we, have, we are very aware of the routines, how to prevent and how to, how to uh, uh, 
increased knowledge about female genital cutting, but also um, among boys. So the nurse, when she had this uh, new couple, who, uh, recent parents who got their twins, one boy and one girl, she has a routine. Uh, so what are you thinking about circumcision? She asked the family at the first control with these uh, young babies. Of course we're going to circumcise. And the nurse said, oh my God, how can I take it? Oh, but you know, in Sweden it's forbidden. Oh, but we're talking about the boy. Are you crazy? We're not going to do it. The girl, of course not. But the boy, of course. So let me just finish with this and, and tell you about that many Somali parents now, they're a little bit, don't tell us more about female genital cutting. It's mm. over there. And of course, we have a high awareness of this. <coughs> and European Union has spent millions of, of uh, resources to prevent and to treat and to inform about female genital cutting. <coughs> and they have succeeded. Now, I think we could reallocate this money to other issues, for example, to have a, a better um, system of uh, communication and interpret the system in our health system in Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Birgitta. Quick question for you. Um, that's a major cultural change exactly. uh, in that community. And I'm, I'm really curious about the... Yes. I'm really curious about the process on how that came to pass. Yeah, and that is... You can apply... There are two theories to explain this deeply rooted cultural tradition. And one, the most famous uh, theory behind it is that men control women's sexuality and it's a radical feminist theory. But then there is another theory uh, developed by <coughs> Eddie Macken, uh, Gary Macken, who talked about something that you do, all, all families want the best for their uh, children. And they do what is the convention. And if there is a shift in the social convention in this case, then other people are eager to also shift if the convention is not any more um, uh, logic mm. or if it doesn't give anything. So the practice, how we think, why do Somali families reconsider this practice in Sweden? because they see that there are other Muslims who do not cut their daughters. You could be a good Muslim without doing it. Fine. We also see that you could get married. You can bring up your daughter in a very nice, uh, uh, appropriate way, according to them, without having them cut in their genitals. And, and then uh, there is no others around them who are doing mm. this convention. So there is a shift in convention. So that is okay. how we believe in that theory rather than the radical feminist theory. That's a very interesting example. Thank you for sharing that. I want to go back to your first two examples who were the, where it was a bit more tragic of an ending. Yeah. Um, what kind of advice would you give policymakers? Uh, and I'm going to ask the same question, basically, for um, health service providers, too, uh, to prevent having those kinds of outcomes you know, in we, the future. We talk, very often we talk to accessibility. Uh -huh. It's a very common uh, uh, use were using by a policymaker, increased accessibility. When we've uh, seen uh, studies in the UK, they, they have one of the most accessible healthcare system in the mm -hmm. world. I mean, people know how to find their hospital or, or the healthcare center. They know how to dial an ambulance. But being there, it's not like in, in low-income country that you have a problem, there is a delay reaching the, the facility level. Here, uh, they're reaching. Even undocumented migrants are re reaching the, the healthcare facility. However, being there, there is something that is not working. And the accessibility that could be better that health system, on health system level, level is the communication. It's, it's, it's the uh, interpreter system. And, and many are saying that, well, people have to learn the language when they're coming here, uh, right? But we can't go doing doing that kind of education in a, at the health facility. <coughs> that should be fixed by policymakers, politicians on another level. When you are there, you have to communicate in, in the way uh, that is uh, uh, 
optimal in order mm-hmm. to understand the diseases or whatever it is. You see my point? I do, I do, yeah. So, so that's accessibility. It, it's, it's not, uh, on, on group level, it's not the problem to, to, to come into the hospital it's, uh, or the facility level. It's there. There is a barrier. And, and uh, the second thing about, um, it, it's about uh, quality of care. Okay. And, and how to improve uh, quality and care. And, and you are, I mean, Europe have one of the best quality care system mm-hmm. in the world. It's even better than the US. Right. It's even, I mean, we have a very... Probably by a long shot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we have a very equal, uh, the equity yes, of health equity, yeah. globally. Mm-hmm. It's, we, we could be proud of that on a European level. So... Uh, you know, that is one of the things so that struck me. Yeah, that, that it is top-notch care usually across Europe, and yet we're still running into some of these problems uh, that should be easily overcome. Uh, yeah, it, it shows I, I the challenge. Mean, I'm not here to blaming mm-hmm. a healthcare provider, but sometimes to just to push them and think a little bit outside the box. Because uh, when, when you have problems uh, that you are not familiar with, for example, we have preeclampsia. That is one of the big killers globally. You know, eclampsia when you're pregnant, hypertension, and you die due to convulsion, and, and you have um, uh, the brain start. Uh, you have a stroke in the brain. You die due to stroke and hi- hypertension. Okay, so so uh, that's a big killer even in Europe among pregnant women. But there is something among uh, certain ethnic groups that we have to uh, mm-hmm. explore and do more research. Why okay. do they have more severe preeclampsia? Okay. So there is more biological issues. Thank you very much, Rikita. I'm sure we'll dive a little bit deeper into some of those as we go forward. So I, I feel like we've done a really good job of depressing you and, and <laughs> <laughs> really setting out the problem uh, of what we're looking at. Um, I'd like to actually ask our last speaker to kind of pull some of this together. Um, really, there are a lot of global and regional tools in place. And Birgitta, if I could just tell you to leave your mic on for one more moment. Sorry about that. You're working on some technical guidance in this area. Is that correct with WHO? Yes. That's a challenge. Yes. Tell us a little bit about <laughs> when that might be available. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Tomorrow they're going to... Um, <laughs> They're going to give me the okay, we've <laughs> feedback. Back to the no, um, <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it's not a problem to know uh, uh, how the, the knowledge, the, the research knowledge that, or evidence that we have, that's not the problem. But the problem is how to frame it for uh, Europe with, simil- with not so similar health system with different perspective, we have different migrants groups, we haven't talked about it, we talk about migrants as is one homogeneous group, which is not, of right. course. And, and um, uh, so, so uh, we are trying to, to um, pull the evidence and make it feasible for policymakers. That's... All right. My aim. <laughs> Good Our luck aim. with that. Yeah. It, from what you've said, it, it sounds like it's very much needed. So uh, I think we all look forward to it. Okay, so now we're going to take all of these problems that we've uh, isolated over the past 15, 20 minutes uh, and put it in front of Dr. Nino Perzuli and ask her to fix this for us. But she <laughs> actually is probably one of the, uh, the best equipped persons to do this. She is currently the program manager for sexual and reproductive health here at WHO in Copenhagen, but she comes directly from a position as Deputy Minister of Labor, Health, and Social Affairs at the Ministry of Health in Georgia. In that role, she was responsible for rolling out and strengthening universal health coverage in that country. And I was just telling her I was at an event in the United Nations in New York last week uh, for World Health Day, and the the focus was universal health coverage, and Georgia was one of the places they put a spotlight on uh, for the impressive program there and what it's been able to accomplish. So now you've done that. Could you please fix this for us as well? (laughs) Talk about the current frameworks we have in place and some of the tools that we have. We're not starting from 
zero uh, to try to address some of these issues. Well, it's a big challenge, actually, but in it, in every challenge comes with opportunity, so <laughs> we have to take it from the positive you know, side yeah. as well. I wanted to highlight uh, some of the very important global and regional uh, frameworks uh, that uh, we have and include the sexual and reproductive health and including the maternal health and that can guide uh, our work in this area to address all those issues that our speakers you know, talked about. Um, and uh, those frameworks and the strategies, they call upon the states to address the issue of the vulnerability of the migrant women. And the all member states, uh, they uh, signed you know, the relevant resolutions. Uh, based on those frameworks and the global strategies. So I want to, the first uh, very important, the key one, of course, as uh, you, we all know, it's a sustainable development uh, goals, which uh, includes uh, the several targets related to sexual and reproductive health, and uh, which aims to ensure universal access to SRH services and uh, health and rights. Uh, so. There are targets also that include the maternal, re reducing the maternal and infant mortality, which is you know, very high and very relevant for our region as well, given the persisting and existing inequalities in maternal health in the European uh, region. And as our speakers already uh, talked about, and they brought very important data, uh, there is um, poor pregnancy outcomes the, uh, that are disproportionately affecting uh, the migrant uh, women. And there is a higher maternal and infant mortality among the migrant women than the, among the resident population. So the other very important strategy is the global strategy for women, children, and adolescent health that puts uh, women, children, and adolescent at the heart, at the center of the way we have to tackle the public health uh, issues. And it emphasizes the need to tackle the inequalities and uh, inequities that exist within the countries and between the countries and allow women, children and adolescents not only to survive but also to thrive and transform. Uh, very important uh, regional framework and the regional guiding document for the European region is the uh, action plan for sexual and reproductive health and rights that was uh, adopted by the regional committee in 2016, which brings the uh, human rights perspective to the sexual and reproductive health, and it is very important. Uh, the, although not specifically on migrant and refugee, uh, but uh, the action plan acknowledges the migrant and refugee women as a vulnerable, core vulnerable group in the European region, and uh, recognizes their SRH, sexual and reproductive health uh, needs, and the core principle is a right to the non-discrimination when accessing uh, the sexual and reproductive health services and the products for the migrant uh, women. Um, the action plan uh, triggered, actually, um, the development and the consultation among the member states of uh, their national sexual and reproductive health strategies, the maternal and newborn health strategies, which is a very uh, big step forward. And the number of countries in the region, in the European region, have already started to develop their uh, national action plan based, uh, which are in line with the European action plan. And I can name, you know, the few of the several countries that have already adopted their strategies, like Moldova, um, Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan, Macedonia, there are a number of countries that are in the process of the development. Country, member states started to look at the inequities, existing inequities within uh, the countries uh, in terms of the access to the sexual and reproductive health services and the product. And I can uh, bring the example of my own country, Georgia, which um, very recently also adopted the action plan for the maternal and newborn health and the reproductive health, looking particularly at the inequities and the vulnerable groups. And uh, the action plan aims to develop the policy of uh, in improving uh, entitlements for the vulnerable groups uh, as are defined uh, the people below living the below poverty line and the uh, migrant population the large mobile population like internally displaced people to guarantee access to the contraceptive products um, so this is a very important uh, initiative uh, the there are number of very important instruments and the tools that the WHO has released uh, during the last few years that will help us to and help the member states to um, 
bring those strategies, the global and regional frameworks into action and provide and equip the member states with the evidence-based uh, standards of care to improve health outcomes of the pregnant women and the infants. One of such very important, which is relevant you know, to our topic of discussion, is uh, antenatal care guideline for a positive pregnancy experience, which includes the recommendations on antenatal nutrition, maternal and fetal assessment, the preventive measures and the key interventions uh, during the pregnancy. But the key consideration of this guideline actually is to ensure the positive pregnancy experience, which is defined as maintaining physical and the social cultural normality, maintaining the healthy pregnancy for the mother and baby, and ensuring the effective transition from the pregnancy to the labor and the childbirth, which if we take the, the case of the migrant uh, pregnant woman, it's already jeopardized given their uh, physical and the mental stress that they are going through during the migration process, uh, being on the move. So this is very important you know, to think about you know, how to address, in addition to the uh, uh, barriers that these women are experiencing when accessing the, uh, to access the healthcare services. The other very important instrument, the guideline that was released by the WHO again uh, in 2017 is um, 18 actually, it's the Interpartum Care Guideline, which uh, provides um, uh, and includes essential recommendations uh, uh, during the labor for labor management and addressing the leading causes of uh, morbidity and mortality for uh, mothers and the babies. It covers the essential care during the labor and the childbirth and also talks about, uh, brings the respectful maternity care, which is in a very important con concept, ensuring the dignity, privacy, confidentiality, informed uh, consent, which uh, in case and if uh, the healthcare providers in uh, the host countries are not trained uh, well, you know, will be very hard you know, to address given the cultural and the linguistic you know, differences. So it's a, it's a challenge you know, for the healthcare providers and the healthcare systems you know, to provide and to um, ensure the respectful maternity care in that regard for the migrant uh, pregnant uh, women. Um, so, if we look at the member states' laws and the policies, uh, which was uh, touched uh, um, by our speakers as well, they are very significant and there is a wide disparity in terms of the, those laws and the policies. Most of the states, is, uh, uh, they do provide some degree of access to maternity care and as uh, Ina said, mostly it's a delivery care. Uh, there is. Um, and there is very limited number of countries that actually offer the uh, range of the sexual and reproductive health uh, services. Emergency care entitlements, they are in the laws of the most of the member states, but what actually, as Ina said, you know, what is actually constitutes the emergency care and you know, how the emergency care is defined, that's another issue. Um, and in addition to this, even if the emergency care is in the law and the entitlement of the migrant women, the 11 of the EU member states, for instance, they require full pay for the services in order to get to receive such care. So this is a tremendous barrier you know, for the migrant women to access the healthcare services, including the maternity care, which is the, the basic human right. Uh, so, the other aspect also, the differences would are in the policies and the practical experience of the, um, of the migrant women and healthcare professionals as well. They don't know what the migrant women are entitled to in terms of the services and that leads uh, both the migrant women as well as the healthcare providers. So this leads to the underutilization of available services and unnecessary refusal of care. So this is uh, from the policy perspective, it is very important you know, to address the, even the, if the entitlements and the kind of the, are in the place, they don't know what they are entitled to, what they don't know what their benefits are. So, um, this is, these are some of the very important uh, topics and um, another issue is the lack of the reliable data and, uh, in many countries and in such context the policy making is often based on the very controversial and inconsistent evidence. So there is definitely substantial room for improvement uh, in this regard and to make sure that the right to healthcare is actually 
uh, equals to the access to the wider healthcare system. Uh, it will be very simplistic to say that uh, um, this all will require action from only health sector. Uh, it requires action and the bridging the policies between the health and the migrant policies, as well as the, um, the changing the agenda of the foreign policy, the security policy. So it's a, it's a very uh, um, intersectoral issue that requires, you know, the multiple actors, you know, to talk, to exchange ideas, to uh, to implement and to develop and implement evidence-based policy. So our role, the WHO's role, is uh, to ensure that you know we uh, share those evidence-based policy, facilitate this dialogue between the, between the uh, and within the member states, and bring the different actors uh, to to place to share the best practices, the best policy practices, as well as to bring the evidence-based standards of care to the countries, assist the countries in. Uh, adopting those uh, standards of care as well as uh, build the technical capacity of the countries to respond uh, to the needs of the migrant women and bring the health sector's you know, responsiveness more to the, uh, and their preparedness to the critical situations like uh, the migration. So it sounds like the, the big barriers are on both sides, uh, in, in fact, getting the women to know what they're entitled to and, and come to the services, but also getting the, um, the policy side to also identify what that is, so there's consistency of practice, maybe? Yeah, so that's uh, in terms of the, again, you know, as I said, the, the entitlement, right? You yeah. know, that's a very good example, you know, that uh, one is the, uh, the diversity and the variation in terms of the entitlements. The other one is actually knowing and the information uh, availability in terms of, you know, what the migrant population is entitled to and, you know, and, and also from the health service provider perspective as well, so that they know when the migrant woman comes and uh, they, uh, they seek you know, for the healthcare services, you know, what they are entitled to. So that's a, it's a multiple channels that we have to work through on the policy side, on the, uh, the information, education, the communication side, both for the migrant population as well as the healthcare providers side. I have one last question for you before we open it up to a broader conversation with, with questions from everybody. Uh, and that is, it sounds like we've got some really powerful tools in place, some frameworks, some guidelines, some technical advice. How do you translate that, though, to the national um, programs? What steps do countries need to take in order to make sure that what they're putting in place is in sync with some of these tools? So we have uh, uh, very uh, important, first of all, it is, uh, um, the, the migration is, as I said, is a challenge, and, but also it, it's an opportunity you know, to address uh, uh, these uh, uh, issues. Uh, but uh, we, there is very limited evidence in terms of the, uh, what are the effective health system responses are and uh, health financing you know, mechanisms for the large mobile populations, large migrant you know, populations that need still, we still need to have you know, more research, you know, more data, more um, sharing of the, the promising practices mm -hmm. you know, as well. Uh, to, to generate you know, some evidence in this regard. But again, as I said, you know, there are some uh, promising practices and the good examples from uh, many countries and uh, uh, it is very important to, to share those. And uh, uh, one of them is, uh, for instance, uh, Malta. They put um, the cultural um, mediators in the system to ensure that um, the migrant population, migrant pregnant women, they are linked, you know, to the healthcare system that addresses the issue of the um, the, the culture diversity as well as the linguistic, you know, the language issues as well. Uh, very important, you know, policy breakthrough, by the way, you know, from the UK actually, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, um, um, alleviated the need for. Um, the documentation, like the immigration status, uh, the address, or the having the NHS number in order to the, to register for uh, the with the general practitioner. So that is very important you now policy uh, initiative. Uh, Sweden also uh, the the role of the 
medical professionals and the medical society is critical to move forward the progressive uh, migrant policies and the Sweden is a very good example of this uh, and, the, and I mean the medical associations, medical professionals which uh, uh, actually f you know, we are championing uh, eliminating the uh, fee for the emergency care uh, for the migrant uh, women uh, population. And uh, they specifically defined, you know, what actually the emergency care entitlement means, and that includes the maternity care, full spectrum of maternity care, as well as um, access, uh, contraceptive counseling and education, as well as the access to the uh, reduced um, cost of the medicine. Uh, the access to the medicine at the reduced cost. So this was very important uh, initiative and the, the key driver uh, behind of this reform uh, and the policy change uh, were the healthcare providers, the medical professionals that advocated for more inclusive care mm -hmm. for the migrant mm -hmm. women. I could keep peppering you with questions, but I won't because I think the audience will start throwing things at me if we don't open it up to broader questions. But I think we've scratched the surface enough to give you a bit uh, of an idea on where we could dive a little bit deeper in these conversations. Uh, again, um, on your platform, your Slido platform, wherever you have uh, logged in, whether it's on your mobile phone or on uh, the computer, put your question there. Hit send, we all write text messages and never hit send and we find it a week later, so please don't do that. Uh, please hit send so that we can share in your question and the answer. And as you can see here, people can vote for a question that they really are interested in seeing the answer to. So we'll let the website um, keep gathering some more questions there. The way we're going to work this is, uh, we are going to take one question from the room and two questions from the website. And the reason we're going to do that is because we've got hundreds of people online, so we want to try to be a little bit fair. OK, thank you. Um, Joseph just reminded me that we have the survey going up now, so please do go online, uh, switch between the tabs of questions uh, and survey, and please fill that out. That's very important to us. Um, and what we're going to do is present those three questions to our panelists. And they are going to take the ones that are relevant to their area of work. I'm not going to have them all try to tackle everything because we will be here much longer than we have time for. Uh, so let me see if we can go through some of these. Is there a question in the room? Yes. You were right. You were first. I don't know if I'm enough. It's a question for the second There's a microphone right there for you. Oh, thank you. It's a question for the second panelist, Mrs. Birgitta Essen. When you mentioned the case of this lady who died from Nang Ambali after birth delivery, there was clearly a problem of communication due to the lack of interpreters, but there was also in the referral system apparently some information about the medical case of this person were completely lost in translation. This lack of documentation about the medical case is it especially a problem for uh, people, people on the move, displaced people, or is it a general problem in the healthcare system in Sweden? And what is being done, because we know that they are not documented enough, so, and what is being done uh, to kind of take countermeasures to correct this uh, kind of uh, negative effect? Don't answer that yet, Brigitte. We're okay. going to throw two more questions into the mix here. And the first one is going to be, uh, as mentioned, these women underwent extremely traumatic events. Several are still victims of trafficking. How exactly is this tackled by health services? And the last one is going to be, is it important for public health professionals to better understand what it means to be pregnant for different migrant communities. All right, does everybody have uh, the ones that are most connected to them? Ines, why don't we start with you? Oh, well, I think I'll go to the one uh, on uh, victims of trafficking and how exactly is this tackled by health services? Well, um, we know that it's a, a very difficult uh, area, and again, it's a bit uh, l related to entitlement and laws. Eh? So in some countries, it's even uh, the case that if you're undocumented and uh, trafficked, and if you go to a health services, in some countries, healthcare providers are obliged to report you to the police. And in case mm. of trafficked persons, this is what we should not do. 
at that point, because a health service as such should be a safe space. This is not only for trafficking, but also for everything that has to do with sexual um, and gender-based violence and uh, uh, specifically uh, exploitation. So a healthcare service should be a safe space, and that means that also that we um, that the healthcare provider should be trained on those issues and to learn how to recognize uh, a victim of trafficking. There are some very easy things that you could learn. If you see a, a, a patient who has a tattoo uh, with, uh, where it's mentioned property of or for sale, as far as we know, uh, there's only one uh, uh, bikers uh, gang that uses it as well, but for the rest we, do, we don't, do not have any knowledge that it would, would be currently in fashion to have that kind of uh, tattoo. But that's a tattoo that is often used um, by uh, um, people who are, are traffickers uh, to put on their, their specific patients. So if you see that, you can be quite sure that this is somebody who has been trafficked or who is still in the system. And then you should try to uh, not only provide care, but also try to build up a system where this person can trust you and bond with you and that can come uh, back uh, to you and that he can work on the other aspects of trying to get this person out of the health system. Of course, this is not something that the health service can do alone, but that building trust is uh, already very um, important. There are a lot of other signals that you, and symptoms that you could uh, learn. Uh, we developed a module a few years back on the SH CAPAC uh, website. You can find this. There's an online uh, training module and there's one module specifically on, on recognizing uh, victims of trafficking and how you can deal with that for a healthcare provider. So I would uh, like to invite people to go uh, and uh, check uh, uh, the, that uh, website. So, but then, <coughs> just to, sorry to finish, um, the fact that these laws are out there and that a lot of healthcare providers are not trained on entitlements of care, they also are going to follow the rules and they are going to report those people to the police. So this is something that we should work on as well. In several countries we have this uh, status of victims of trafficking that they have some specific, uh, specific protective status. So this is something that we might think on uh, how to spread this uh, through other uh, European countries as well, I think. Rukita, do you want to tackle the question that was asked from the room? Yeah, about uh, uh, um, a common system for, for a register system, for a um, patient system. Well, it, it, it depends on each country what you decide. Sweden has moved from uh, having a um, welfare state system, which is tax uh, paid, but to a more uh, new public management, more private sector are included in, in the uh, health system. And, and um, the private sector is not, has not the same uh, obligation to, to store and to, to connect health data as the public system. So, so that is, on health system, it's an answer to your question. That you can't get data from the same patient uh, within the health system as the health system seems to start to be divided from public and private. So that is. Okay. Nina, which one are you going to tackle? Well, uh, <laughs> I mean, various questions actually, but I wanted to reflect on um, the, the pregnancy. And uh, there was a question about the, I think, it, what. It is important whether or not it is important for public health professionals to better understand the actually the, I think the needs of the pregnant women for different migrant population that you know what is probably is, uh, meant uh, here in this question and uh, the of course you know there are multiple issues that the women are facing you know throughout the pregnancy that uh, includes also not only the health related issues but also there there are other um, aspects uh, that uh, need to be tackled during the pregnancy and uh, this will will be done and can be done through the proper counseling and the proper education and the proper uh, interaction with the healthcare providers uh, of pregnant women. They, when I mentioned the new antenatal care guidelines, it provides the recommendation and calls for the eight contacts vis visits, you know, with the healthcare professional, which is very critical, not only from the standpoint to um, detect, you know, timely the, the any complications during pregnancy, but also to address those issues that the women might face, you know, during the pregnancies and the questions uh, that, you know, sh they might have. So uh, the uh, when we have the 
barriers accessing the antenatal care and when only the emergency care and the delivery care is provided. So we are missing this critical window opportunity of tackling not only health issues but also other issues that the pregnant women are facing. So that's why it is, you know, um, coming back again, you know, to the entitlements and the policies uh, of the host countries. It is critical to ensure that the women are accessing the full spectrum, the continuum of care from the antenatal care, intrapartum to the postnatal and the postpartum care in order to ensure the, that we have the healthy pregnancy outcomes both for the mother and the baby. Is there another question in the room? Go ahead. Uh, I'm interested in uh, migrant sex workers. Uh, is there anything in place um, to better support their specific health needs? Let me add two more in there. We've already addressed Niels, so let's go to how can we build trust in health services and medical practices to improve and increase utilization and uptake among migrant women and their families. It's what we were talking about at the tail end of that there. So uh, thank you for going a little bit deeper on that. And the last question we're going to take for this round. Thank you for the evidence summary. What should be the policy changes to these poor outcomes of migrant mothers and their newborns? So looking for policy changes. How do we build trust in health services and medical practices to improve utilization and uptake and sex workers in migrant communities? Inez, what are you going to take? Well, I'll maybe tackle quickly the one on uh, building trust a bit. Maybe Birgitta can complete there. I think we can uh, be yeah, complementary there. Um, to, to build trust, I think it's really important that we invest much more uh, on that and how we can do that. There are several, there's several things. I'm very glad that it was mentioned, the migrant women and families. The migrant women do not live in a vacuum. Eh? We also have dads often, eh? or mostly there are also men and dads involved. And I think we are often forgetting to um, implement them, to get them aboard. And they are also expecting things from the pregnancy and how they are going to become father and what that changes in their lives and their relations to uh, the, the women they are uh, living with. And um, so I think it's very important to get the, the fathers aboard. Uh, for some countries or for some migrant communities, the mothers-in-law are very important, and there's a cliche for something, but mothers-in-law <laughs> can be quite mean also for pregnant women. So we should uh, know how to deal with them as well and see all of them, not only the pregnant women, but also the people who are uh, surrounding them. And I think it's important that we build that trust with the communities themselves, that we do not do this separately for them, but with them. So that means also that they should be employed, that we need more migrant people in the healthcare, uh, as healthcare uh, providers and do that uh, together. And then I think finally we should start at school. If we uh, talk enough about sexual and reproductive health and the several impacts that has on the rest of your life and what you could do to space children or to uh, develop further, then I think that uh, we could already go uh, a big way. I don't know, Birgitta, if you want to add something to that. You agree? You don't disagree? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a big issue. And, and I just, I just want to stress one thing, that there is a big difference between the view and, and the value, how we see, look upon reproductive rights. I mean, we could recognize when UN tried to do the Millennium Development Goals and the SDG, what was the problem? That was the reproductive rights. I mean, that's how it is. So in Europe, if we, it's very easy to talk about uh, the individual's reproductive rights, but at the same time, now you are saying that we have to uh, respect and, and talk about the different cultures where families are included. That is actually a, a challenge, because if you talk about the women's individual rights, which is one of our norms, and then we talk and, and talk about culture and big family, extended family, and everybody should be part of the decision of being pregnant or not being pregnant, or whom you get married with, or who you will have sex with, and when you will have sex. That, that's, I mean, that is really um, a big problem. It, or it's it just challenge, we should not say a problem. Do you see what I mean? That, that sometimes we are a little bit naive 
talking about uh, the reproductive rights as it is a norm. It is actually a norm. And it's not for the whole world, it, it is very much more complicated than, than that. So, so uh, I, I always want to, to give a, um, a recommendation when we discuss this. We have one thing is on the individual level and being professional in, in the encounter. And there is one single word that can help us in the meeting uh, with foreign-born people, and that is professionalism. Treat each person on, on, in a professional way. There is no way how to treat the Syrian or, or the Swiss, but being professional. But then on a group level, uh, we know who are the risk groups. And then we can, where, where if we have identified risk groups, then we can focus on intervention. But intervention should always be based on evidence, not on assumptions. And then we are back to you talking about uh, evidence. How could we get evidence? I, I was, it's really good that you stress that we lack registers and register the data. And, and um, how could Europe uh, facilitate to pool more registered data in a, in a, of course, in a sensitive way and, and, and uh, how to handle personal data? We know today that it's, it's a very uh, hot topic after Facebook scandal <laughs> and so on. But nevertheless, uh, one thing that is behind one of the best evidence in the world uh, is, um, you know, how to save mother's life and, and to give birth at, uh, with skilled birth attendance. You, you are familiar with skilled birth attendance, the slogan from mm -hmm. uh, Safe Motherhood and so on. That was based on registered data from Sweden from the 1700th century and so on. The, the, the evidence came there from when it was implemented. So, so I really, uh, message take home for, for policymakers is how could we uh, pool data or um, develop registers that could be useful for the whole population. I like that it should be based on evidence and not assumptions. I like that. Uh, Nina, yeah, what are I you think, going to Yeah, that's a very important question yeah. and, you know, that's a uh, dilemma, but, you know, it can be addressed again. You know, most of the countries in our region uh, are building their, their surveillance systems and the birth registries, you know, that are modeled after the Sweden and the, in the Norway and there are a number of countries in the Eastern European, you know, region, let's say, that are building those registries, which will be very important, you know, for uh, research and the evidence synthesis is uh, I think it is very important to integrate, you know, the data that you know comes, you know, from the migrant population into those uh, into those registers, and maybe think about, you know, try to find innovative ways to address the the data gaps and the data issue among the migrant population as well. But you know, I fully agree with you. That's a you know big thing uh, that we need to focus on. But I also want to also to pick up on the what Ines said about the importance of uh, integrating. Uh, healthcare professionals, you know, from uh, the migrant healthcare professionals into the uh, the host country healthcare system, and that's a very important, um, very important uh, solutions. I would say. The, one of the uh, practices, the promising practices, or the, the best practice in this regard, is uh, Turkey. In you know, Turkey, tries to integrate the Syrian healthcare professionals into their existing healthcare system to address the needs of the Syrian population, the large influx of the Syrian, and address their healthcare needs. You know, and the and from the cultural standpoint and the linguistic standpoint, of course, it is you know easy. So that might be you know something that's a uh, uh, solution and a promising practice that other countries you know would uh, consider. But um, in terms of the the policy, what are the policy solutions? And you know, we already talked about the entitlements. And you know, I would repeat again that the migrant women should be able to access the high priority services without the discrimination and the without incurring the um, uh, prohibitive out-of-pocket expenses. So that uh, should be our goal and the, the policy changes that we need to tackle immediately. And I really like the idea of integrating the migrant health workers to build that trust uh, so that more people come. I think that's going to be key there. All right, who's going to tackle our sex worker question? I, I could tr to try to... Um, the problem is that, that there's not much evidence out there 
yet for sex workers. And um, again, we have here a problem if um, sex work is legal or illegal in a country, and that's not the same in, in most European countries. In some it's accepted, in others it's tolerated, in others it's uh, illegal, and you can, uh, if you're caught doing it, uh, you can uh, just be deported back if you would be uh, undocumented uh, as well. So there are several organizations who are working on that, and um, they are trying to provide care, but uh, as far as I know, on a European-wide uh, level, there is still too little uh, evidence on what should could be helpful and how this could be uh, done. Because, of, of course, we know that a lot of sex workers are trafficked or are already in networks that are very well built, but the healthcare provision network or what we could do to support them is not that networked yet or not uh, that outlaid yet. So I think there's still a, a lot of room of um, improvement there, uh, both on the research side as on the provision and the protection and support side. Okay, we have a few minutes left, about 15 minutes, so I'm gonna encourage you to go fill out the survey while we take another round of questions. Uh, so on the Slido platform, there should be a tab for questions and then a tab you can pop over to uh, to answer the survey. While you're doing that, any more questions in the room? Yes, go ahead. The microphone is coming your way. Hi, and, and thanks for three really fascinating insights into this incredibly complex and complicated topic. Um, so the word culture kind of pops up seemingly you know every few minutes somebody uh, um, mentions uh, uh, something to do with culture and I guess uh, um, from my perception from what I've been hearing the emphasis has been on the kind of uh, the need for healthcare practitioners or people in the healthcare system to understand the culture or the cultures the cultural dynamics of the people who enter into that system um, but I know particularly in Sweden I think there's been quite a lot of effort also in relation to integrating um, migrants into the um, into the population uh, and into the culture of the population, helping them understand the, the specificities and the complexities and the dynamics of the, of the Swedish kind of cultural practices. Um, and, and I think that works. I'm not entirely sure how it works, but I think it works via kind of um, training or, or workshops or, um, and I don't know how compulsory they are or, or how voluntary. But I'd be interested to know whether or not those um, um, opportunities are, are also kind of um, thought of as opportunities for healthcare providers to kind of uh, um, engage with the, the, the migrant population on some of these topics, and, and if they have, whether or not that's been successful. All right, let me add two more to that. First, it's going to be, are there any country examples where interventions to improve the social networks, peer support groups, have been implemented? And if so, could you talk about it? And the last one will be, what evidence is there for the state of maternal and newborn health among migrant communities within the European region. Uh, for example, the Roma populations. All right, everybody got their heads around which question they're gonna take? Nina, why don't we start with you? So we'll quit picking on Inez. So I think uh, the evidence in terms of the state of maternal and newborn health among migrant communities and the Roma population, which is, uh, um, there is uh, the data that uh, shows that uh, their uh, pregnancy outcomes as well as the uh, maternal and infant mortality and morbidity rates are high enough for the, the Roma population. They are, have, there is a tendency or uh, the issue of uh, access to the healthcare you know, services and the, uh, for, for the Roma population. That uh, brings also that affects you know the poor pregnancy outcomes and the maternal and infant morbidity and mortality, which in the there is a need you know to tackle. And in you know, the most of the countries that have this ethnic you know minorities, you know they are trying to integrate the policies and the practices that you know uh, specifically address the needs of the Roma population. I remember uh, in Romania the uh, during um, it was you know several years ago. The USAID programs uh, that were on the sexual and reproductive health programs, you know, they were uh, working, you know, with the government to develop the specific policies to address the needs of the Roma population and the access to the family planning services and the contraceptive products and bringing the services closer to the population, closer to the Roma population, having the Roma mediators in the system in order to facilitate and navigate the Roma population and bring them closer to the healthcare services. So these are one of the 
the examples that you know we uh, that was used in the programs, and I think now it's uh, still integrated into the healthcare system to address the Roma population needs. I think it's one of the things all of you have mentioned at one point or another: the idea that this is not a new problem uh, in Europe, and to what degree we can learn from the past. Argita, what are you going to tackle? Well, I brought up the, the aspects of culture, and, and I, I will not further go deeper into culture. I'm not an anthropologist. But uh, with what I have learned over these last two decades, when it comes to, if we stick to the topic of the, this webinar, when it's, it's about pregnant women uh, and newborn, uh, when it comes to this specific area of sexual and reproductive health and rights, maternal and newborn health, are you with me? Yeah. Then there is less uh, culture-related problem, pure culture-related problems when it comes to maternity health. And uh, I say one thing, for example, and that's why I stress that we should be open for the dynamics in the world of culture. And also, you know, in, in most countries in the world, over half of the women are giving birth at home. There's a tradition of giving birth at home, traditional birth attendance, right? You have heard about that tradition. We have the population of Afghanistan. We have a lot of them in Europe. And no single Afghani family are asking for traditional birth attendance and traditional birth at home. So you see how quickly in, in, in maternity there is Changing. a change. So. So sometimes we are, uh, we have seen, I can give another example where I have seen big problem when we stress culture too much in, in, in uh, maternity ward. And that was when we, get, we, we became aware of that there were many women, mostly from uh, low African, uh, in, from Somalia, who refused emergency cesarean section. And in the 90s, a lot of people thought that that is their culture. Well, they are doing so, they don't want, they don't want to be uh, delivered by C-section, and the babies died. And we thought it was very interesting how babies could die in front of, of healthcare providers in Europe without being curious, what should we do about this, how should we prevent, why do the Somali refuse C-section, despite that the baby is dying and even nearly the women were dying. So when we interviewed the women, this is a long time ago, we, we found out that this was based on a very rational strategy. The Somali women, they were afraid of intervention that they linked to maternal mortality. Because in their country, uh, uh, of uh, their country in, in Somalia, where there is very low resources, many women are uh, dying due to intervention that they don't have ne that without appropriate uh, tools. So. C-section became a proxy for something that could kill me, for the, for the Somali women. But when we explain and, and communicated with them that this is a, a very excellent uh, hospital, you don't have to fear the C-section, etc., etc. Now we see that Somali, they have adopted to and accept this, the C-section. Too much C-section. No, not <laughs> yet, not yet, not yet. They are not like the yeah. Middle Eastern group that yeah. are begging for it every time. But you see, um, and, and of course, I don't want you to go home and, and think that culture is not of importance, but don't overemphasize it in maternity uh, and newborn health. But we should focus on it more and explore it more when it comes to sexual health, reproductive health matters, if you, if you see what I mean. But I prefer not to answer your question about uh, making foreign-born people more Swedish in Sweden. <laughs> I, we take that later, I think. <laughs> Ines. Okay. Uh, the one on the peer support groups, and if there's evidence on that, if I could explain a bit. There are several studies uh, done on that. It's uh, often called, uh, well, in, in uh, countries where you had to have a lot of Christian communities, they call it the godmothers, and then the, the mentor mommies, it's all, in, in fact, uh, uh, often called in other countries. So in UK, this has been a tradition for several years, also in the Netherlands, and it has been tested quite well. So these are um, 
women that have been pregnant already, uh, who are mothers uh, now of a certain communi community, and they are trained uh, on sexual and reproductive health, on, pre on uh, maternal health, on newborn health, on risks, on how uh, to navigate the health system. And they also train um, uh, peers, and then they become key, fact key, key uh, persons in uh, these communities. And it works uh, very well. We also see that uh, not only for migrant women, this has been working very well, but also for most of the other women as well because we do not learn at school how to be pregnant and how to become a mother or a father uh, it's suddenly that something is expected from you that you know by nature <laughs> but it's not that easy uh, so the mentor mummies that were originally developed for migrants is now something that becomes for uh, other non-migrant uh, women uh, as well and um, in uh, the UK you also have um, some uh, uh, groups with uh, Pakistani midwives who have been training other uh, women who are not midwives but they become also some uh, key uh, intermediate uh, uh, persons uh, there in Belgium we also had it for uh, more on sexual and reproductive health and on sexual violence and it we also did that in eight European countries. So there's a lot of evidence out there, in fact, on that. And it works um, well, but we should not uh, expect uh, that they have the same knowledge, of course, as the healthcare providers themselves. But they could be a very good bridge. But do, did I understand that they were training people to be healthcare provider without official no, training? No, 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 no. They, they become some what assistant. What about packet? Yeah? Yeah. Because th that is also interesting, that we, we, we promote... There is the doula system yep. and so on. Yep. And, and I think we should reflect two times about that. Are we trying to build up a parallel health system no. where we give one level of care, one kind of care for foreign born, in this no. case Pakistani, and they have not uh, the same type of midwives that the Swedish women have? No. I, I'm just, I'm, because there is, in, in UK, there is a, a big, uh, they have a big interest of, of building up healthcare system one for the Kurdish, one for the Jewish, one for the yeah, and so on, Pakistan yeah. and so on. Yeah. And, and in Sweden we have discussed, yeah. if, is this the way we want to have it or yeah. we want to have a public Both all? of your colleagues yeah. are shaking their head no, yeah. so let me give them each just one moment to feed in because we are running out. I think the, the most effectively, effective approach is actually to integrate into the existing and bringing the migrant population and the services for migrant women into the existing national health system and make the health system responsive you know, to the needs of the migrant population. So that's uh, the most effective approach. Yeah. Person-centered care. Person-centered, yeah. yes. I, I totally agree. Yeah. It's being a bridge and, and trying to get each other closer, but not being different. Yeah. All right, we have three minutes left. Is there one question in the room? Okay, I'm gonna take one from over here. Joseph, could I have questions? What would be the way to provide postnatal care to undocumented irregular migrant women and retrain them or retain them in care when their entitlements are in question? Anybody wanna tackle that for two minutes? I'll, I'll tackle briefly <laughs> the part of retain them in care when their entitlements. Oops, it's gone. We have that question back, Joseph. Sorry. Well, um, like uh, in Belgium, we have uh, uh, the law is as such. We have urgent medical aid, and uh, that means that undocumented migrants are entitled to that emergency care, and everything that has to do to delivery is considered as such. Uh, but there's a whole of lot of ad administration to do, and normally you should go first to uh, arrange all that administration and then get your care. So if you have to deliver, that's a bit difficult. But for undoc the undocumented uh, migrants in general, they now have uh, something tested in uh, the university hospital where I'm uh, uh, working, and it's a voucher system. And that voucher system is something that is often used in low- and middle-income countries, but not in Europe. So it's a voucher system that if you arrive at a hospital and you're undocumented, then you will see at least one uh, specialist or at least one doctor and they will do that emergency care for you. And in the same time, they will already try to arrange all the uh, administrative uh, things that need to be done by the hospital staff itself, by the social workers. So it's not you who have to go and find it yourself. So you're staying in the hospital and at that point they are doing this arrangement and they also keep in contact with you the moment you are discharged from the um, a hospital. So that was the latter part. I don't know for the first part if somebody wants to say something on the postnatal 
care for undocumented migrants? Or the we do not have reflections there? Nope, we have exhausted the <laughs> best practices and samples from the panel here, and we've also run out of time. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and bring this to an end. Uh, thank you very much, um, both the audience online and the audience here in the room. Uh, a special thanks uh, to Dr. Severoni's team for putting together such a fine panel. Uh, the webinars continue. This is part of a series. The next one will be on June 5th, and the topic will be child health and unaccompanied minors. I think today we've started the conversation. Obviously, sharing some of the examples from uh, different experiences is hugely helpful. Uh, I think uh, the important thing is, is that the conversation continue on as we go forward and try to uh, make some changes to reduce these uh, poor outcomes in maternal health and newborns in migrant and refugee community. So thank you very much for your participation.